Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is a US election uh, update special, giving you the news and my views on the presidential campaigns taking place for the November election in the US. Now we have Harris and Trump, and as I've always said, uh, well, slightly different for each one. So Trump has got a hard ceiling on the support he has if he's going to keep appealing only to that support in the more extreme ways that he does. And that hard ceiling is about 46%, give or take. In order to get elected, he needs to expand that base of support to go into the centre to attract the independents, the undecideds, and even some of the dis, uh, disaffected Democrats, right? That's how you win an election. You don't just stay trying to consolidate that base and likewise for Harris she wants to do that and the question is who is doing a better job of this and many analysts are saying that Harris is doing this big broad tent kind of uh, approach to winning the election which is exactly what you should do just absent of any other information if you you're more likely to win an election in really in most countries uh, generally if you're going to have an appeal across the spectrum uh, and so she has had hundreds of literally hundreds of republicans come over to her side um and she has had lots of republicans speak at the dnc etc etc so she's going for this broad tent approach uh, and saying look i i have uh, in the on oprah winfrey she said that you know she owns a gun good luck to anyone that comes in uh, and breaks into her house type things. That's a, again all these things that might sound off the cuff. And she said, "Oh, I'm going to have to get my aides to to sort this one out. This is going to be a bit controversial." But that's actually strategically exactly what she wants to say, which is, "I have a gun. Like, I'm up for sensible gun reform, but I'm not going to take your gun away. I own a gun." Uh, and so it's like, I on immigration, it's like we want a strong immigration um, policy. That is, you know, she needs to play to all these fears that people have and go across the political spectrum. So who is doing a better job of that? And I would say at the moment, and I think the polls reflect this, and the movement in some of these other sub kind of polls, like what are your views on who's better for the economy, on who's better for this and who's better for that? There is movement in Harris's direction, which would indicate that she is doing a better job of appealing to those outside of her core base. Um, and, and that's what this is all about. So everything we talk about today is going to be in the context of who is doing a better job of of appealing to that wider audience. Now, one of the weaknesses or perceived weaknesses for Harris is the economy, even though statistically, if you look at what's happened in the last however many um, presidencies, the Democrats have actually done a better job of getting the economy back on track after taking over from Republicans, etc., etc. So there's a difference between perception and reality, and I know a number of people will probably go start spitting at the screen over that, but actually go and look at the data on this. But there's a perception, it's interestingly, broadly the same in the UK, there's a perception that uh, Labour, that the Democrats aren't as good on the economy despite that evidence. And so they need to overcome the this perception as well as recognizing. So the, the Democrats have to do several things. They they want to recognize that people are feeling inflation. Even if for the last 14 months it consecutively average wages have increased above inflation. In other words, like from a really um statistical point of view and an unemotional point of view inflation shouldn't be much of a problem but because people have ideas of what prices cost in their what prices are in their heads and they're still existing in some kind of pre-covid scenario the perceptions are somewhat skewed i saw a really good analysis looking at why there is this really big lag between uh, perception and reality so reality is over here perception still back here people are still existing in this kind of pre-covid scenario where they're expecting prices to be x y and z and of course these are global influences that affected supply chains and have affected prices and then you've got war in ukraine and, and oil prices etc etc that actually individual governments can't very easily control and so not only is there a difference an unfair difference between perception and reality but there's also an unfair perception that uh, any given government is always 
responsible for movements in things like inflation uh, when they're more often than not part of the global um, interaction of all these different economic uh, variables. Okay, so with that in mind, the job then for the Democrats is to say we are strong on the economy and not only that, but it's all about contrast and, and the Republicans are weak or Trump is weak. And you know, here is the granular detail of what we are going to do with the economy and this is what they're going to do and ours is better. So not only looking forward, but also elements of, oh, and by the way, so they still, I think, need to do this. Now, someone commented the other day and I can't find a comment anywhere, but it was someone saying, look, me, I think it was something like me and my husband, or well, my husband's really strong union guy, been a lifelong union guy. And he didn't realise until recently that actually the funding, it was, he was a teamster. That was it. I'm going to find it now. I just remembered it wasn't on one of my videos. It was somewhere else. But the comment was that uh, my husband's been a lifelong teamster, etc., etc., really unionised. But he didn't realise that the teamster retirement fund so the the pension was all kind of he was going to lose a pension and then it was all saved and it was all fun and dandy and he didn't realize until he was explained re recently explained this by someone that actually the democrats have put in place the the package that saved his retirement fund and, and i think the implication was that here was someone that, w that was you know not realizing the impact that say the democrats have had on his life and you know the pro-union pro-welfare states kind of scenario th that they have have brought to to bear and you you can talk about the infrastructure bill the chips act uh, the, you know all the inflation reduction um bill etc cetera, etc cetera. all of these uh, things that, that the Democrats have put in place that are starting to have real tangible effect on the American economy and on people's pockets and on people's lives. So my point is that the, 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 the Democrats need to sell what they are, their vision of the future, whilst also selling their successes of the past and explaining to people what they've actually done. So when you've got a lot of low information voters out there who don't really keep an eye on what, what's happening, they'll just think, oh, this thing cost this and it used to cost that. Therefore, this government's at fault. End of. Rather than explaining all the things they've done in order to keep inflation much lower than it otherwise would have been and explaining how that manufacturing job that your brother's got or your cousin's got, well, that's due to a boom in manufacturing due to you know the, inf the infrastructure bill, the Inflation Reduction Act or whatever. Like all, all of these things that they have done that are now coming to fruition need to be better explained. But it's not resting on those laurels, but also presenting a positive future. Now, the Republicans, on the other hand, have to look at Biden's um, last four years and try and say that it sucks. Right. So they're just going to be trying to say how bad Biden's been on the economy, which is I'd, I'd say it's difficult to do because actually it's not true, but actually it's easy to do because they can just lie or they can convince people of a false narrative and perception is more important than reality, etc., etc., uh, and then try and sell their vision of the future. Now, where the Democrats are going to come back onto that is, well, his vision of the future is if you're really rich, you'll be all right. He's working for his rich buddies. We're working for you. We were speaking to you as an everyday American, and we're working for you. And she's worked really hard, Harris, to make sure that that's what people understand when they listen to her, that she's actually someone who represents them and has their best interests at heart. Whereas he doesn't. Now, OK, so the criticisms against the Democrats or against Harris is that she has not been on TV enough. Uh, but then you've got to understand that she was preparing for a debate. She'd only just taken over. Most people are campaigning for two years, preparing for the next presidential uh, campaign, knowing that they're going to run for that. She only found out a few weeks ago. So people have completely unrealistic expectations for her and say, well, she should be doing this. She should be doing that. She should be doing that. I mean, she's, she's just getting everything together, sorting out a team, sorting out the, the policies and the agenda and the schedules and training for a um, a debate that was massively important. And she's pretty much knocked most things out of the park to different degrees, where people are saying she's weak still is on explaining her economic agenda 
in a concise way and doing it enough as she is doing it because the needle is moving on the economy for, for, for the polls. But is that enough? And then obviously immigration. The two areas that the, Demo the, the Republicans are going to campaign on big time are the economy and immigration. And here is one, one of her, this is her first mainstream media uh, interview with just her alone, not with Tim Wells. So before with CNN, it was her and Tim Wells and Dana Bash. Here she is on MSNBC, where she was talking almost exclusively about the economy. And I would argue that some of her answers are probably too verbose, which is hilarious coming from me, right? Can't shut up. But I'm, I'm saying two things in long convoluted sentences. However, I think for her to win over some of these people watching, her answer on tariffs was good. Like all her answers were good, right? She's she's really competent. And my goodness, is she not more coherent than Donald Trump? I mean, just this is like competence and uh, just solid <laughs> syntactically coherent uh, answers to to questions. But sometimes she could go right. Tariffs are bad for you, the American people, and this is why they're bad. Bosh, bosh, bosh. It's it's a sales tax. What's it's a sales tax. What do I mean by that? It means that you are the one that's paying for the tariff, not the Chinese exporter. You're going to pay for it when they when two hundred percent tariffs are put on that microwave. Who pays for that microwave? It's you. You're paying for it. So who's paying that two hundred percent increase? You're paying it. So where does where does Donald Trump's two hundred percent tariffs come from? Where do, where does that money come from? It comes from you. So uh, simple things like that just really obviously tie his economic policy into how it's going to affect your pocket and how that will affect uh, affect inflation. Now she did answer that, but in a more kind of obtuse sort of way, or not, or not quite as. And concise. Anyway, here's uh, her answer to one of the first questions in terms of the economy in general. Well, here's what I know in terms of the facts. Donald Trump uh, left us with the worst economy since the Great Depression when you look at, for example, the employment numbers. It was during COVID and employment was so high because we shut down the government, we shut down the country. Even before the pandemic, he lost manufacturing jobs by most people's estimates, at least 200,000. He lost manufacturing plants, ask the auto workers how he lost auto plants. We have grown over 20 new auto plants. Um, he has an agenda. Let's just deal with it right now going forward, not to mention what happened in the past. It's really important as, as well to talk about that because there's this misnomer, there's this misunderstanding about how uh, it was all great and then COVID happened. It was only COVID that did his economy in. Well, now actually it was, it was going on the down before that and, and that's what she's pointing out. He has an agenda that would include making it more difficult for workers to earn overtime an agenda that would include cutting off access to small business loans for small businesses, an agenda that includes tariffs to the point that the average working person will spend 20% more on everyday necessities and an estimated $4,000 more a year on those everyday necessities. So th she does mention that kind of tariff thing there, but when she has a full tariffs question, that's what she needs to do and, and then explain exactly how that works, but really concisely. To the point that top economists in our country, from Nobel laureates to, to, to people at, at, at Moody's and Goldman Sachs, have compared my plan with his and said my plan would grow the economy, his would shrink the economy. Some of them have actually assessed that his plan would increase inflation and invite a recession by the middle of next year. So the facts remain. And she's right. Facts do remain. Uh, I mean, certainly factually, there are an awful lot of economists who have endorsed Kamala Harris. So 400 economists have endorsed her. Is that the case for um, Donald Trump? No. Uh, she needs to be selling that, but also without trying to sound too elitist. But that should mean an awful lot to both corporates and working class Americans that Donald Trump has a history of taking care of very rich people. And I'm not mad at anybody for being rich, but they should pay their fair share. But tax cuts for the billionaires and the top corp corp corporations in our country 
and then not really paying much attention to middle class families. My perspective on the economy is when you grow the middle class, America's economy is stronger. And there's empirical evidence to prove my point correct. Then let me ask you about taxes because... And, and by the way, just the thing is, people grade, as everyone keeps saying, people grade Donald Trump on a curve. So like, you tell me a time where Donald Trump has been as coherent as that. Honestly, tell me. Tell me a time where he has given you a sense of his economic vision, who he's working for, who the other person's working for, without just going, ah, comrade Ka Kamala, uh, she's just a communist, and blah, blah. you're like, no, no, no. Okay, let's, let's set out what you envisage for the future and s tell us what you achieved previously, because really the only thing that he achieved in his tenure was uh, a tax cut for the, for the rich, which he wants to not only extend, but also increase. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I just, and the whole interview is just very competent human being explaining her position on the economy and then getting into more granular detail. And she needs to do that more and more uh, and possibly refine it more and more to some really... Um, sound biteable moments where if you're a low information voter you, you're getting a really clear idea of who she's fighting for and what she stands for um so anyway that was her first interview there on uh, alone with, with mainstream media she's been also hitting other places she's you know she her and doug emhoff her, her husband in fact i was just listening to an interview on, on uh, the rest is politics us really busy going about doing interviews left, right and centre. She is also doing interviews off the beaten track, you know, trying to hit some of these niche places, radio station here or, or, or this and that. Uh, I think she needs to be doing local as well. Local interviews in battleground states is going to be super important uh, to chipping away at these fine margins. Vice President Kamala Harris will visit Battleground, Arizona today, this is today. for a major speech on border security and immigration. It will be her first visit to the southern border since becoming the Democratic nominee. Now so this is a big high risk thing and she needs to do this because immigration is the big one. It's what the Republicans are absolutely hammering the whole time. That is perceived as their greatest weakness of Democrats. Uh, and what she's going to be doing is saying, hey, we had the strongest bipartisan border bill going uh, and it was it was vetoed by Donald Trump. No other, none other than Donald Trump. And so if you want this bipartisan deal, Senator Lankford and all these other Republican senators and, and lawmakers involved in putting that together, if you want that, then I will put that into place as soon as I am president. So she has got a policy that is strong and she's just released an advert on this. We'll, we'll go to that in a second. Now, according to a senior campaign official, Harris will call out Donald Trump for his role in tanking a bipartisan border bill earlier this year. In August, the Border Patrol recorded about 58,000 encounters between ports of entry along the southwest. So it, it is an issue. Interestingly, it has dropped. So it's become less of an issue, which has been very useful for Harris. And that could be as a result of some of the um, uh, executive orders and, and whatnot that, that Biden uh, put in place that uh that might have had an effect on, on on border crossings there so that's been good for harris on the economy of course dropping interest rates is going to be good that's going to affect because house building and, and buying houses has been a, another major pillar of the uh harris campaign so it's piecing together you know the the economic with with the house with the you know the sense of people's pocketbooks and inflation and so on and so forth piecing it all together seems to be you know working to some degree for harris at the moment but is it enough and then there's this uh, this advert that's just come out kamala harris has never backed down from a challenge she put cartel members and drug traffickers behind bars and she will secure our border here's her plan hire thousands more border agents Enforce the law and step up technology and stop fentanyl smuggling and human trafficking. We need a leader with a real plan to fix the border. And that's Kamala Harris. I'm Kamala Harris and I approve this message. Now, I would say that's very vague uh, and it 
it kind of has to be because it's only what 30 second ad or something so you can't really go into the, the details there it's just the kind of headlines this is what we're we're planning on doing without detailing how you you do that now as long as there is really good uh foundations to to those plans then then that that should be good and it's essentially going to be the bill right that that was that was put forward that bipartisan bill which is great for the democrats because they can sell that hey we reached across the aisle we did this deal with some of the most conservatives senator langford is voted the second most conservative senator in congress and so you know this is an astonishingly conservative bill really uh, and yet Trump stopped it because he didn't want to campaign. He wanted to campaign on this. And if you solved the problem, at least somewhat, before he got to do his campaign, then he would have nothing to campaign on. All those things, though, that, uh, Susan, all of those things that Kamala Harris said she supported would already be law of the land right. if Donald Trump hadn't called Republicans on the Hill and said, kill this conservative bill. Yeah, no, you're... Exactly right. And uh, what you're going to see then is this battle between, well, look, we would have had this, but you stopped it. And then him saying, oh, you, all these 15 million illegal immigrants, we're going to deport them. And, and th those kind of big bombastic claims for, for many people is, is what they want to hear. But of course, what she will then do is come back and say, by the way, if you deport 15 million people, what effect will that have on the economy? Mm, an inflationary effect. So you're talking about inf tackling inflation by what? Putting tariffs on goods right across the board, not strategic tariffs. These are tariffs right across the board, which will have a massive inflationary effect on everything and getting rid of potentially cheaper labor, which a lot of people might say, yeah, we want that to happen. But but you've got to understand the ramifications, which will be an inflationary effect. And so those two main things that you are planning to do, the two of the biggest things you're talking about, will have the exact opposite effect on inflation that you would want, considering that inflation is one of the big you know, central points to what people are, are looking to be solved by either candidate. Um, and I, I think it's incredibly important. And so therefore, it's no surprise that 400 economists have... Um, have endorsed Kamala Harris. I mean, I think her economic agenda is far more responsible and coherent uh, than Donald Trump's. And, you know, you can argue with that. If, you, if you're a Republican, listen to this going, oh, you're a load of rubbish, blah, 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 blah. Fair enough. OK, but come up with the reasons why, because you're not just arguing against me. You're arguing against 400 people who are, this is their job. This is their expertise. Like you can say, oh, it'd be wonderful. It'd be wonderful, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, no. Okay, let's have a look and see what the economists say and see why they're saying that. Uh, and then give me a coherent, a coherent argument as to why Trump would be good for the economy. And if you're going to rely on tax cuts for the rich and trickle down the economics, I'm afraid you, you haven't got a leg to stand on, really, because the data is pretty solid for trickle down economics not working. And I would argue that much more effective is trickle up economics and, and investing in those uh, working class and, and bringing the, the economy up by stimulating from the bottom rather than letting it trickle down. Um, so anyway, but I don't I don't want to to digress too much. And in fact, you know, when you're looking at the effect of Biden Bidenomics or the democratic approach to uh, the economy. Actually, what are we seeing? We're seeing record manufacturing, record employment levels, record uh, stock market levels. I mean, all of the indicators are not just good for the American, for the Democrats. They are outstanding. Like it is really quite incredible, and they've managed to get inflation to lower than any comparable country. So yes, it's still you can argue inflation is still too high at two point nine percent or whatever it is, um, but it, it it is doing incredibly. They have done incredibly well, all things considered. Welcome back. Take a look at futures this morning. Uh, another rally underway. The Dow Industrial is up sixty seven. The Nasdaq up forty three. S and P five hundred up seven and a quarter extending into further record territory. Uh, we're looking at last week's rate cut rally continuing. The Dow and the S&P 500 closing in record territory yesterday. So that's where we begin this morning in uh, uncharted territory. The Uncharted territory, but having record levels. Now, 
lots of people are loving this on the Democratic side because this is Maria Bartiromo, who is an avowed Trump fan and hates like Democrats. And so when she has to admit this on on Fox News and uh, you know talking business, people are kind of delight in that. But that's the reality of the situation. Now, of course, remember that Donald Trump was very much one who would say the success of the economy is is defined by, not even reflected in, but defined by the success in the in the stock market with the stocks and shares and and the Dow Jones and the S and P and Nasdaq, so on and so forth. Like that's how he would he would always talk about. Well, look at this, look at that, and actually, that's not. I don't think it's a very good indicator because there's an awful lot more than just massive corporations uh, making a big bunch of money as to see the economic health of a nation. Like, let's look. How's what's the effect on the working class? How how are they how are they doing? How's the middle America? But anyway, if that's what you're going to do, which is what Donald Trump did, then he has to he has to admit by his own standards that the Democrats are doing far better than he did, like literally record levels. If that's your indicator, mate, then you, you've got some admissions to make. Anyway, moving off the economy, it w- it's going to be a fight, economy and immigration, right? Now, let's look at some endorsements. This is Lisa Mikowski, who's a, a, who's a Republican senator from Alaska, but she's not been a massive fan of Trump. And now she has said that she's not going to vote for Donald Trump. And that's a Republican senator uh, uh, who is in position. I don't think that it can be defended. What happened on January 6th was, was, a, was an effort by, by people who stormed a building in an effort to, to stop a, an election. I wish that, uh, that as Republicans, we had a, uh, we had a nominee that um, I could get behind. I certainly can't get behind Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. Are you considering being an independent at this point? Oh, I think I'm very independent-minded. <laughs> uh, officially, I, though, officially. I just, I just regret that our party is seemingly becoming a party of Donald Trump. Yeah. You becoming an independent caucusing with Republicans, is that something you're open to? I, I am navigating my way through some very interesting political times. Let's just leave it at that. So I, that's absolutely fascinating. So it looks like she's not endorsing Donald Trump. She's possibly considering becoming an independent. And in fact, she, she's, I probably, I don't know enough quite about this, but I think she's probably got enough bipartisan support in Alaska to make a success of that. And uh, and that'll be fascinating. Uh, in in the same way that you had Kristen Cinema doing that in Arizona, but going the other way, and you had um, Joe Manchin doing that in uh, West Virginia, where he uh, yeah, and he's now come out and said he's not endorsing Kamala Harris. So this is going the other way on that, and I, it doesn't surprise me at all. And I think she's absolutely right with her rationale. But again, not good news when you've got. This many Republicans coming out, former former Republican, either lawmakers or people in the administration or generals or whatever, all of these people, you know, when you've got Dick Cheney and Liz Cheney who are coming out, these are not people who are suddenly going, oh, I'm a liberal. Right. Dick Cheney is not suddenly, oh, yeah, I'm for the big welfare state and I, I'm for the little guy. And, uh, you know, and so Liz Cheney is not all about pro-choice. Right. These are people who are still deeply, deeply conservative. I'm not saying Lisa Mikowski is, is like that. I think she's probably quite centrist. But when you've got a lot of people who are deeply conservative coming out and saying that they are going to endorse Kamala Harris, they are not doing it on ideology. And this is so important to understand because Lisa Mikowski has just spoken to this. And there's a lot of people out there. I, I know there's a lot of people that are contacting me on, on the threads to say, I'm not voting uh, Republican this time, and it's because of January the 6th. And this is what Lisa Mikowski said, and this is what Dick Cheney and Liz Cheney said. This is a th- genuine threat to democracy. Now, I know that some Republicans will call that out for being so inflammatory that it's led to assassination attempts, even though mm, Trump's called people vermin and uh, Laura Loomer's called for liberals to be executed for treason, right? But it's it's too inflammatory to call uh, Donald Trump a threat to democracy, even though 
you look at January 6th and it's blatantly obvious. Now, the, the, the problem with this is that that is what drives people who are kind of senators or former lawmakers who are very interested in the abstracts of ruling, of politics, and the kind of higher ideas of political ideology, right? But for your low information voter, it that's political noise. Like January the 6th has now become political noise. And some of the bombastic things that, that Trump says, they can if you if you corner them on it, they'll say, yeah, yeah, it's a bit nuts that. But actually it's not going to define what how they're going to vote. Uh, and so there is this risk for the Democrats that these all of these Republicans coming across because they they feel Trump is a threat to democracy will shift the needle a tiny bit in terms of some of those higher thinking voters the the really engaged electorate but actually that's that's a relatively small proportion of the of the voters and the low information voters are not going to be swayed by this kind of uh, thinking um now in terms of endorsement three former chairs of the main republican party have endorsed vice president harris quite as former chairs of the main republican party we enthusiastically endorsed kamala harris for president of the u.s each of us had the honor of traveling the state of maine to recruit and support candidates and to talk about the values of the big tent republican party that that a big tent republican party once stood for trump's MAGA republican party is unrecognizable to us in other words i was talking right at the beginning of the video that that um Kamala Harris is trying to attack, uh, erect this big tent Democrat, uh, Democratic Party, whereas that used to be what some people thought the Republican Party was. So, you know, those centrists and center rights and then further to the right, but all in, in, in one, you know, comfortable tent. And actually, the, Repub the Democrats were like herding cats. These guys had a much more unified um, approach to, to government. And it doesn't seem to be the case anymore. It's rather like in, in the UK, you had this fight in the in the Conservative Party between what's what was called One Nation Conservatives. One Nation Conservatives, like all of us together, we've got our conservative principles, but we understand that the party is just a slightly, the, or the, the country is more than just us. And so we need to bring people together. And that's that kind of centrist approach. And the One Nation Conservatives essentially lost out to your... Uh, you're far more right wing going to reform conservatives and and you've had this big infighting or, or this schism and as a result of that reform came out of that and then Labour swept into power. Now with the Republicans you have the threat of this happening but it hasn't quite happened. You've got this drawing away of some of these people from the Republican um, I guess yeah, for, from from the Republican tent, some of these big players, some of the administration. Has that happened enough with the whole of the electorate? I don't know. You haven't had this split yet like you've had in the UK with reform, but this is something that people have been talking about for some years, that it needs to come to terms with its schizophrenia. And you cannot have what is going to happen if Trump loses the election. Do they say we've lost the election because we weren't hardcore enough and go even further to that MAGA republicanism? Or do they do they admit that they've lost the election because actually we didn't become big tent enough? And so they get rid of the MAGA. But then what happens? Those people still exist and those beliefs will still exist. And so will it have split into two parties? And uh, But then, of course, it's never going to get into power. So what I, I think it would be much more representative. I think you need a multi-party system in the US like you do anywhere. I think two-party democracy is the weakest, thinnest, narrowest form of democracy that you can have and is not representative of the people. So I, I think that would be good in the long run that that happens. But in terms of getting into power, that will stop the Republicans or whatever they become getting into power if they if they split. It's going to be interesting. Now, um, the Border Patrol Union has blasted Donald Trump for stopping President Biden and Kamala Harris's plan to help the Border Patrol agents close the border. Trump is putting politics ahead of solutions. Now, that is interesting. So this is on Fox News here. Uh, we'll just listen to what he says. Ever goes forth has to be much better immediately. Uh, Harris, we're not going to.
get much better immediately, so I'm going to take those incremental steps. If this were going to tie Donald Trump's hands, I would be opposed to it immediately. It doesn't. It doesn't tr tie any good administration's hands. So why it do you think he's it against ties, it? it I, I, I have no idea. I haven't spoken with him about it. If he, if he has specific issues, let him air those issues. I will give the positive points in this bill. There are negative points. But if we don't even let this bill come to light, if this bill doesn't even go to the floor, we don't even get amendments. And that's what everybody's talking about. Everybody's talking about killing it before you're able to even offer amendments. That's wrong. Let's have the Whatever goes for and and you know that's obviously going going back in time to that bill, but you know border patrol union president being on board with the bill as it was because you know you've got to start somewhere and that was a good strong bipartisan bill. Right, we're going to go on. I I did a separate video uh, talking about uh, um, and I really liked that, really enjoyed that talking about the media landscape with regard to uh, local TV stations and talk radio in the US and how it skews massively to the right. Uh, with Tim Miller talking to Michael Medved, who's of Ukrainian descent, interestingly, but he's a conservative talk radio host who is also not voting for Trump. And come to the bulwarks, a bulwark is, is a kind of former conservatives ha having a home in their endorsement of Kamala Harris, realizing that the GOP is not what it used to be. Now we're going to look at what you do in terms of endorsements, because we've been looking at endorsements there. Paul Ryan, the former speaker, uh, Paul Ryan, who has come out, the Republican, a, a staunch Republican, who has come out and said he is not um, endorsing Donald Trump. But the question is, what do we do, says Tim Miller, with these people who refuse so he refused to endorse Donald Trump, but then also refused to endorse Kamala Harris. Is this, how does this work? I want to talk about, let's listen to Paul Ryan. Character is too important to me. And, and, and it's a job that requires the kind of character that he just doesn't have. Having said that, I really disagree with Biden on policy. I wrote in a Republican the last time, I'm going to write in a Republican this time. So what that means is, if you couldn't hear that, he's going, not going to vote for Trump, but he's going to write in a Republican like he did last time. So the second election in a row, he's going to write someone's name, I don't know, Edwin, Edmund Burke or someone, who, somebody. He's going to write in rather than vote for Kamala Harris. But of course, you know, in a, in a binary option, it's not. I don't think it's good enough to say, I'm just not going to vote for them. Because you're saying, I don't want them to win which means by extension, I want them to win over them. So you should be voting for them. This is uh, something I, I've talked about previously with Prof Gerdes on his channel, because he's like, I won't vote for Trump, but not, not happy voting for Harris. And I think the same with um, Greg Terry, who I interact with quite a lot. Republicans who are not fans of Trump, but don't want to vote, in, vote for Harris. And I think that is problematic personally, even if it's in the, you live in a state, I think it's a bit of a cop-out to say you live in a state where it doesn't really matter, so whatever. And they, they talk about this, I think, here. You're going to write in. Yeah. Republican. I don't know who yet. So I'm interested in your take on just the write-in choice altogether, but I'm interested in his phrasing in particular. I'm going to write in a Republican. Like, from my perspective... Like the Republican is just a party. It's not an ideology. Right? It's a group of people. And this group of people have chosen Donald Trump three times. And so like this notion that there's like some true Republican out there from 20 years ago that he's going to write in, like to me, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I think that's kind of playing pretend. But maybe I'm too, maybe I'm too cynical. I don't know. What what, what did you think about, about Paul Ryan's uh, explanation about his choice this November? I'll bet he changes his mind before November 5th. Really? That, uh, yeah, I know Paul, and he's a terrifically good guy. He's one of those leaders I admire who wasn't at the Republican convention yeah. and wasn't really welcomed at the Republican convention. There were no prior show. Republican presidents or VPs at the convention. I, Palin would have been the only Incredibly one. Incredibly interesting I being there. observation. No, and <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I made the mistake because – in 2016, I was so certain, as most people were, that Hillary would win and would win in a landslide that I didn't see any reason to vote for her. Um, and because of policy disagreements, even though I've known her since law school, but in, in any event, uh, I voted for Evan McMullen. 
<laughs> which is, uh, you know, seems like a it's good better guy. than right writing in Edmund Burke. At least Evan oh, McMullen right. was alive. <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, when, when that election happened and Trump actually won, I felt very guilty for not having a, at least voted for the alternative candidate. And I, I resolved that I would never do that again. I mean, it's stupid to to basically say that, well, there is no choice. There's always a choice. And even if you're in the state of Washington where Trump is not competitive anyway, uh, it still matters. And every one of those votes matters because that's part of your legacy in defining who you are. In the lead up to the 2024... All the time. So uh, I think that's a really good point, and I would advocate, you know, if you, in a binary choice, you're not going to vote for one and vote for the other. If you really don't want this person to be in charge, you think this person is dangerous, or you, whatever your reason is, you really don't want this person in charge, then you, by default, it's not that you want this person to be in charge, like if, if your first candidate didn't exist, it's just that, of the two choices, this one is way worse. And I don't want. So you've got to vote for the other one to try and get them over the line. They are the least worst option in your opinion, right? Uh, I just I don't get writing someone in. I, I think it, I personally think it's a bit of a cop out, right? Here is a bit of news that is kind of bizarre in the context of having a go at Haitians for eating cats and dogs, which is of course not true, and has has been debunked but in the context of oh poor little poor little pets uh people uh, secretary esper john bolton yeah. oops uh, sorry i got that wrong place here it is dogs but there's one other but there's one news story this morning that i just had to share with you i don't know if you've seen this yet i'm, I'm hoping i can surprise you it's in the guardian Kevin Roberts, uh, the president of the Heritage Foundation. So the Heritage Foundation, who put together Project 2025, that apparently uh, Donald Trump knows nothing about, even though hmm, J.D. Vance wrote the foreword for Kevin Roberts' book on, on essentially Project 2025. It's just, yeah, anyway. Um, who has led the MAGA Trumpy turn of the Heritage Foundation. Mm -hmm. What used to be a, a history professor at New Mexico State University. Several sources at New Mexico State University told The Guardian this. Uh, he was discussing in the hallway with various members of the faculty that a neighbor's dog had been barking relentlessly and was keeping the baby and his wife awake, and he kind of lost it and took a shovel and killed the dog. End of problem. Three, three separate sources on that. that uh, Terrific. Kevin Roberts Maybe he was dog. part of the Christy Noam coalition. <laughs> I mean. So Christy Noam, famously, like another Republican, a Republican lawmaker, shot her, shot her dog. Um, and she admitted that in her biography for some weird reason and got into trouble for that. It's like, this is, yeah. <laughs> it's it's like, dog killing coalition. The Haitians are eating the dogs and the cats, allegedly. <laughs> we have no evidence of this. But right. Christy Noam and Kevin Roberts, two prominent MAGA officials, are, are known dog murderers. It's, you know, every, every uh, accusation is a confession, I guess. Is it? Yeah, pretty incredible that. Uh, right, we're going to go then finally to a, uh, a what I think Tim Miller missed out here uh, big time. Like I would have spent 10 minutes talking about this at least. This is absolutely like one of the core aspects of this campaign and in fact our realities at the moment. I talk about this all the time on the channel, disinformation. Uh, and we have had Donald Trump and J.D. Vance stand up and lie like overtly lie to their audiences like the other day it was that the u.s has given 300 billion dollars worth of um aid to ukraine and that every time Zelensky comes to the u.s he walks away with 100 billion dollars that's just it's literally empirically not true how can you stand there and speak to thousands of people and tell that lie these people to hold them in detention and then to transport them to countries that don't want them. And by the way, this is one of those things where I, I, I do think Kamala has to be more rigorous. Uh, Trump says all the time, they're taking people from mental asylums, from insane yeah. asylums and from the jails and they're deliberately taking all those people. And that's why supposedly, according to Trump, the crime has gone down so much in Venezuela and elsewhere. None of this is true. Right. And 
really there has to be more of an ability to to educate uh, the American people to to the extent that many of the things that Trump is, has been saying repeatedly over and over and over again are just things that he knows very well to be lies. Yeah, all right. Well, I have to do it. And he goes off, uh, Tim Miller just has something in his head and he goes off to talk about that. But that, to me, was like, wow, right, this is gold. This is a gold mine of discussion here. Like, what do you do about these people who are being disinformed? How do you educate them? How wh what do you envisage? How do we hold people to like to account for the lies that they overtly tell? It it is a it is a serious problem. Okay, uh, it's worth noting that Melania Trump is nowhere. You've got Doug Emhoff being an amazing first gentleman uh, as as a spouse of Kamala Harris, just campaigning on her behalf and doing a tireless job. Melania Trump is nowhere. It, I would be, as the Democrats, I don't know whether they feel bad doing this, but I would be putting out adverts saying, uh, where's Melania Trump? Uh, this is the single human being that you would expect to stand up most for Donald Trump. His bloody wife, right? The, the person that arguably knows him the best in the world, and she has apparently not endorsed him. She By actions. She has done a runner, and she didn't do a speech at the RNC. And she won't touch him bodily. And it is it is not good. And then there's news that's come out that she pa or paid herself or the Republican campaign paid her. This is going back in April, actually, to speak at a log cabin Republicans event. Is that log cabin event? Is that the LGBT um, group within the Republican Party? I'm not sure. Anyway, she gave a log cabin Republican event a talk to them charging them two hundred and forty thousand dollars and it wasn't much of a speech either and i think was that also in mar-a-lago um too anyway yeah, trump uses donor money to pay his wife two hundred forty thousand dollars to do something that a candidate spouses do normally for free it's all a grift so you've got doug emhoff is going around campaigning tirelessly he's not taking money for going and giving these speeches um, and and yet here we have Melania Trump like grifting. So I presume that money goes back into Donald Trump's coffers to pay for his legal fees. Absolutely shocking that. Absolutely shocking. But to give a small speech like that uh, and, and grift two hundred forty thousand, two hundred thirty to forty thousand dollars for that. Right. Uh, FBI has released crime stats. So talking about lies and the idea that crime is going through the roof and et cetera, et cetera. Now, Republicans have been saying, well, actually, crime is going down. FBI has released 2023 data, which has shown that a continued trend to that going down. Murder and manslaughter, nearly 12 percent down. Reported rapes, uh, more than 9 percent down. Hate crimes, less than 1 percent. Overall violent crime, estimated 3 percent down. Property crime, estimated 2.4 percent down. Now, what um what Republicans say like is so inaccurate it's not even funny. They all say oh this doesn't include big cities and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But that is not true. So in 2021 the FBI changed the way they did the, the stats to include all the big cities. I think nowadays I think these are like 96 percent of the population is covered in this. So these are accurate stats. Unless you think 4% of the population stack all the statistics the other way, then you've got not got led to stand on. These are genuinely better stats. You stop going back to a point where the stats were done differently and claiming that's what's the case now. It's not true. And you can go and find it. I watched an analysis on that recently just to say that the criticisms from Republicans are unfounded. And this does genuinely show that crime is dropping from the rates they were. And when when Donald Trump is going and talking about how terrible things were. Uh, he went to S San Francisco recently or, or something. He was talking about, or he was talking about San Francisco and saying, I remember when it was great, you know, back 15 years ago and crime wasn't so bad. And of course, that was literally when Kamala Harris and Gavin Newsom were running San Francisco. <laughs> He's like, I remember when it was amazing. Mm, who was running it was amazing? Oh, the person you're campaigning against right now. So you're actually saying she is really good at r running things. Okay, well done, Trump. Um, yeah, so anyway, worth, worth, um, worth knowing now laura luma who was the um the white extremist i would argue uh that has been associated with the campaign she's been flying around with donald trump um then 
you know, this got all blown up by CNN, I think, did a report and et cetera, et cetera. And I was talking to you about Laura Luma. Some of the things she has said, she was the one that, that advocated for the uh, execution of liberals for treason, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it turns out that who knew? But the Republican strategist said, mm, probably not a good idea for you to fly around with Donald Trump any, any, anymore because it is actually pretty bad for the optics. Yeah, you think? Uh, anyway, Laura Luma is going now into scorched earth on the Republican Party after being told she can no longer travel with Donald Trump. So Laura Luma then goes on on Twitter. What does the Republican Party do for me? They've never done, never done anything for me. I do everything for myself. Uh, and then some saying I can't name a single accomplishment the Republican Party has has had in the last four years. And then uh, same here, says Laura Luma. Uh, if Republicans keep the House and take back the Senate, it won't be because they deserve it. It will only be because they rode the coattails of Donald Trump. Not a single Republican is happy with the GOP. They have done nothing over the last four years, if we are being honest, so on and so forth. She's absolutely torching Republicans in general, that larger kind of Republican entity rather than Trump. She is massively still aligned with Donald Trump and Donald Trump still have her on board if it wasn't for the fact that she was called out big time. It's interesting, she's replying to Joey Manorino here. So Republicans love losing for the sake of pretending they like each other. This is Joey Manorino saying, I remember when Mike Johnson became speaker and everyone, including me, was saying how amazing he would be and what an improvement he would be over McCarthy. Uh, Laura Luma is a lone voice against him and saying that he's he'd be a rhino. Anyway, he was a guy that was caught going onto a sock puppet account, which was a, a a black woman, and saying, I am a black woman and I'm against Joe Biden or whatever. But he, and he put a picture of himself as a black woman, but was still logged into Joey Manorino. And people caught him and took screen grabs of that. It's like, oh my God, you have just done yourself in and, and fully uh, revealed that you have sock puppet accounts where you pretend to be a black woman. Joey Manorino is one. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that these people do. Absolutely uh, terrible there. Um, so uh, what do we have here? Oh, yeah. The other bit of news, super important bit of news. If you remember, Nebraska has a state, is, is a state where you have a district in the state that has its electoral college votes going to wherever that district votes, right? So you have Nebraska and Nebraska's second district, and the second district is much more Democrat, usually, and that has one electoral college vote that then goes to the Democrats, and the other Nebraska um, electoral college votes go to where, wherever they vote, normally Republican, right? And what they were trying to do is bring it together into a whole state so that it's not split into two districts. And that would get rid of that one Democratic Electoral College vote because there's the, the rest of Nebraska would overcome that Democratic. So overall, you just have, what is it, four would go to Republicans instead of three and one or whatever the numbers are. Now, you've got the same in Maine, but it goes the other way. So you've got a, a, a district in Maine that goes to de uh, the Republicans and the rest go to Democrats. And the Maine lot said, look, if you go and change the rules there, we'll change the rules here and then we'll, we'll be back to square one. So don't do that. So what the Republicans did is they left it until the very last moment so that Maine wouldn't have a time, wouldn't have time to build up a um a legal case to do that and then they said right we're going to do that just you know this was only last week so they they said we're going to do that and it required in the end it came down to the vote of a democrat who's crossed the aisle to go with the republicans who then said i'm actually not going to vote for this because it sucks so the nebraska state senator who republicans hope would help ease uh, former President Donald Trump's part of the White House by agreeing to change how the state allocates its electoral college votes said on Monday he would not do so. And he's got in, in loads of trouble from Republicans who really wanted him to do that. But um, that's really good news because that could there are some pathways to uh, the some electoral college pathways that, that see Nebraska as being that Nebraska second district with its one electoral college vote being what decides the election. It depends how it all falls, right? Okay, what else? Uh, Kamala Harris has just received the endorsement of the Polish community in Pennsylvania. More than 800,000 Polish in there. So that's a huge endorsement. And of course, there are quite a few Ukrainians there as well. So when uh, Zelensky went to Scranton in, uh, in Pennsylvania to visit the army ammunition plant, there was the appeal to those 800,000 Polish and the Ukrainian voters there. And then when that was weaponized, although you could argue that was being him being weaponized by the Democrats, Republicans are claiming that that was 
the, and they weaponize this whole situation, the whole Ukraine war. And of course, when Pennsylvania is the key to the election, this is the one state, whoever wins Pennsylvania, pretty much is going to win the election. By annoying Polish and Ukrainian voters there, because you are you are calling out Zelensky and calling out, you basically you're appeasing Putin, you, you've got a really, you've got a much stronger chance of losing Pennsylvania. So that is, in my opinion, the wrong way for Trump to to have taken uh, his his um, campaign. Uh, I I love this from Jessica Tarlov. She's amazing. Her interview recently on Pod Save America was absolutely fascinating. If you get a chance to watch it, uh, because she's the lone liberal on the five and pretty much on Fox in general, and she fights her corner, but she does so to try and make sure that those swing voters who do watch. Uh, Fox get to hear that alternate voice and she brings her receipts every day she is one of the greatest assets for the Democratic for the Democrat uh, party and now the uh, child tax credit I, and Wait, now what? that the child you, tax credit yeah yeah oh, oh, P- oh, President oh, oh. Trump started it oh, and then she, she upped it she upped it and the camel hats and the oh, tax on tips and now crypto so, A, that's not true. Okay. B, child poverty was cut in half when the Biden-Harris administration implemented the child tax credit and the Republicans got rid of it. If Tim Walls is as terrible and embarrassing as you guys think he is, why does he have a plus seven favorability and J.D. Vance and Trump both have a negative 13? And Kamala's at plus three. What, what's going on? What, what's going on with this loser with the clean air filter, right, that people seem to like? Capital L. Absolutely brilliant. And she's like... Look, you guys just all the time are slagging off Waltz uh, and and Harris as being like losers and this and that. Why is it then the American public m- they've got a a positive favorability rating, and your two guys suck? Like, why is it that the, these your two have got negative thirteen? Like, what's going on there? Because it can't be that they keep coming up with insane ideas uh, that are clearly uh, like evil as you guys say, if, you know, this is how people feel about them. But yeah, she she brings her receipts all the time. I love that she's so evidence-based. Right, there was a, I haven't got it on, I don't have it on on here, but there was this thing where, uh, where Donald Trump went and took a note out from I, th- I think he got it from one of his aides. In, he was doing a, a campaign event at a supermarket, and then gives gives I don't know a hundred dollar bill to some woman at the at the checkout, which is interesting because that's illegal. So uh, that's the first thing to note is that you can't pay you can't pay people to kind of vote to bribe them to vote for you. So that is not something you're supposed to do. So anyway, but I put, made an argument that actually. This, uh, this is, um, in fact, I, I, I've got it on here. I'll just show you the, um, I'm sure I'll, I'll, I'll find it for you because I think it, it's worth watching. So this is the Donald Trump um, supermarket situation. Here, <laughs> it's going to go down a little bit. <laughs> So that's the Daily Show saying a thousandth crime bribing a voter. 18 US Code 597 expenditures to influence voting. Whoever makes or offers to make an expenditure to any person either to vote or withhold his vote or to vote for or against any candidate shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than blah, 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 or both. In other words, that you can't do that. Uh, but OK, no one's going to follow through on that, no doubt. But just it, it, it's worth noting that. And I said that that something that Kamala Harris did really gives you an indication of the sort of person that Kamala Harris is. And this is it to me. So make of this what you will, but I'll I'll give you my impression in a second. Hello. I support Andy. Language deprivation for deaf children. Thanks. So I I just said hello. I said that 
that if you compare the the character of these two people, like this tells you everything you need to know, in my opinion. And then and then someone came up on on we just had this massive argument on Twitter. It was like, yeah, well, Trump gave this woman a hundred dollars. That says way more. That's way more generous. Like if you, so, if you think giving a hundred dollars as a billionaire to some random in a in a checkout is worth more than someone taking the time to learn some sign language and then use that to support ending language deprivation for deaf kids. I don't, I, I can't, we can't be talking because you have such a different um, metric for evaluating people. Like this is, this is pure like empathy, decency and kindness. Like not only is, is like I, here are some people who are struggling. These are people in society who are disadvantaged. I want to do something to improve them from a policy point of view. Right. And then I'm going to take time out of my mental busy calendar. Now you could say it's for PR or whatever, but she's the sort of person that would want to do that. Uh, that takes the time to learn some sign language, s- struggles through doing this to to try and do sign language, to speak to those people, to help uh, end language deprivation for deaf kids. Right. You compare that sort of person to someone that goes, oh, yeah, let's yeah, give you a hundred dollars. Uh, and then someone arguing with me that that, that billionaire giving a hundred dollars, like how easy is it to do that? Like what what out of his time and effort and what does that show about his love uh, or his empathy or his desire to make uh, you know disadvantaged people better? Yeah, okay, you could argue maybe she was disadvantaged. I don't know. Does he know who she was? Just gives her a hundred dollars, bish bash bosh. Uh, like that to me tells you all you need to know about the characters between these uh, you know these two people and just like the arguments i've had about this just i it blows my mind that someone could actually try and and argue that 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 he is a better person for having uh, given 100 dollars you know as a billionaire anyway um Right, uh, this I thought was a nice little nugget to show you how important immigration is to people as voters and the perception of immigration. So just look at this. So what's the most important issue for you as a Pennsylvania voter? Uh, the illegal immigration into this country. Yeah, how is it hurting you and folks you know? It's not. It's just the principle of the fact that they... So what's the most important thing for you? Illegal immigration. Thousands of people coming into the country. How's it affecting you? Bear in mind he's up in Pennsylvania in the north of the country. It's not. How's it affecting you, your family? It's not. Really, that's interesting. So you've got someone who's not voting on policy that affects him, but on these big kind of scaremongering things. Or, or It's just a fascinating little insight. Folks, you know. It's not. It's just the principle of the fact that they, you know, everybody comes in here and gets free stuff and taking stuff away from hardworking Americans, and we got to put America first again. Absolutely. We've heard that all around the country. Thank you very much, John. And that's Newsmax. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the idea is a zero-sum game, not a positive-sum game. And there's an argument about uh, um, immigration to be had here and sensible immigration and sensible policies and blah, blah, blah. But it, it's very clear that a lot of people see immigration as a zero-sum game. Like, they're, anything that the, this person gets is taken from my pocket. And therefore, I have to be against that. And even though these people don't actually really affect me in my life at all, uh, but I'm led to believe it's terrible and therefore it is terrible. And that's what I'm going to be voting on. And, you know, if, if one person says we're going to deport 15 million illegal immigrants, then he's got my vote. Uh, it's just it's important. How do you deal with that? I mean, that is that is her job um, at the moment is, is to deal on the economy and uh, on on immigration in a really robust way. And now I've talked about, I did a whole video on Trump's gobbledygook on the economy previously. Josiah from Pondering Politics had a really good video on this. All right, friends, we have a couple of clips to look at in this video. As you know, Donald Trump is the oldest presidential candidate in American history. He's 78 years old. He would be 82 at the end of his second term if he wins the presidency. And poll after poll after poll after poll after poll has shown that a majority of Americans doubt his physical and mental fitness to be president, certainly since President Biden withdrew from the race. So the vulnerability, which was 
more, whether we like it or not, according to the polls on Biden, is now on Trump. And it's up to you and I and everybody else to make sure that the American people continue to dwell on Donald Trump's cognitive deficits. He's also helping us out in a roundabout way because uh, he made the mistake of sitting down for this interview. And again, the, the conservative interviewer, Cheryl Atkinson, for whatever reason, decided to ask Trump a substantive policy question. And we're going to play the clip. Uh, but I mean, as you can see, like, it's just pure gibberish. OK, pure gibberish. And as bad as it looks in text, it sounds a hell of a lot worse uh, and looks a hell of a lot worse when you actually see him deliver it. So we're going to play this clip and unpack it together. But brace yourselves because this is Trump falling apart. Kamala Harris has been very short on specifics when it comes to economy, other than saying she wants an opportunity economy. What are the specific mechanics of how prices come down, you know, the steps that would be taken in a second term for you? So, first of all, she can't do an interview. She could never do this interview because you ask questions like, give me a, a specific answer. She talks about her lawn when she was growing up. This woman is not equipped to be president. She's not equipped to deal with President Xi, who I was very, I took in hundreds of billions of dollars with him, and Putin. We had no war with Putin. Remember, and I'm just going to go off just for this. I'm not going to interrupt this like I did in my original so much. I'm just going to say, remember, the question is like, what's the substantively, you know, what is what are you going to do to reduce inflation? And he's he's complaining that she couldn't answer that question because she would go off on one and talk about something. And he's doing exactly that. And then going off on one and talking about random things and not answering the question. With Bush, they took a lot. Russia with Biden, they're trying to take everything. With Obama, they took a lot. What are you talking With about? With Trump, Russia took nothing. Just remember that. You know, it's a little, a little chart. But what? What happened? And when you look at what took place, what? was so sad. When what? they took over, they cut the oil way down, and oil started going through the roof. It was going to go to ten dollars a gallon. It was going to go to numbers that nobody's ever seen. And so they went back to the Trump drilling. They said, let it go back. That was the only good thing, but they stopped because I would be there, but four years later, I would be triple what the number was right now. I am going to just, I said I wouldn't pause it. He's, part of his problem is that he uses so many pronouns that you don't know who he's talking about. He keeps talking about they, I, they, well, I obviously, they, it, it, they. And when you change subjects in sentences, you which I think he does, you end up not knowing exactly what is who's the subject and who's the object of the sentence. And so it's syntactically a complete mess. And you just left thinking, I have got no idea what you're talking about or who you're talking about here. And they said it's so bad. What is it? And who are they? And yeah. They're just about even where I was. But they only did that because of the fact that they eventually have an election coming up. And the, you remember at the beginning what happened. That's one of the reasons that Putin went in, because it went to $100 a barrel instead of $40 a barrel. And he could fight all the wars he wants with those kind of numbers. Cause I know what you're thinking. Wow, surely that's it. No, it's not. There's like a whole second half to this, but we'll just get to it. So again, you can see him visibly losing his train of thought because he's just so focused on making personal attacks uh, against Vice President Harris and casting aspersions. No concept. Well, well, I've told you most of what you need to know, but I just want to remind you of this because I think it, you know, it it is so important to get a, a grasp of how little uh, detail and knowledge he appears to have of, of the requisite subject matters. Direct and get something more concrete out of him. Because he's a big seller of, of oil and gas. So what happens is they went back to what I was doing just said, reopen, just reopen. It wasn't hard. It's so crazy what they want to do. What are you talking They're about? They're going to destroy lives. They're going to destroy the, what they have done to this country, and especially in the sense of allowing millions and millions of people come in, because that's something, you know, we Oil, can fix immigration. the gasoline situation, and we can fix the uh, anything. Do prices things? come down magically because it's not them? They come down. So she's like, right, I've had enough of this. Uh, you know, OK, let's get back to prices and get back to inflation. Anyway, it goes on and on. You, you can go and watch my video on that. But just when you when you compare something like that as an interview to something like this as an interview. It is honestly chalk and cheese. Like, 
I don't understand how you can sit and listen to him ramble on nonsensically and go, yeah, he's the guy. He's who I want running my country, like the biggest, most important country in the world. Uh, he's the man that, that's going to know what he's he's on about. He can't coherently answer the simplest of questions. Kamala Harris can. That 24 minute 16 video there is entirely her being cogent and and making making sense and giving detail. He doesn't do that. That is a huge worry. Right. Uh, we're going to go on to some just little rally clips here. And remember this about Russia. Under Bush, they took a lot. Under Biden and Barack Hussein Obama. Has anyone ever heard of him, Barack? Barack Hussein. A lot of people say he's actually running the country right now. I don't think so. I don't think so. But some people say he's running our country. It's easy to forget, but the reason he says he puts that stress on Hussein is because he's invoking racism, really. That is the only reason. Like, we kind of forget that, and we're used to hearing him say that. But let's just remember what he's doing. Um, okay, now Question. we've got uh, another kind of rally. Well, this is a town hall. This is an interesting one because he was with the farmers and he was a lot calmer, a lot less bombastic, but he still made no sense economically speaking. Question? Yeah, please. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Taylor Cockmore is respecting the news. I've spoken with some economists about your proposal for tariffs, and they say they don't see how it will not make items cost more in the United States. So the question is, I've spoken with the well, it's not really a question yet because you interrupt me. I've spoken with economists about your tariff proposals and they say they will make items cost more in the United States. So the idea that he's going to put 200% tariffs on everything or tariffs across the board, right? Across the board, not strategic tariffs saying mm, this steel coming in from China, we're going to put tariffs on Chinese steel just because we want to get our own. Is That's called industry protectionism, where I'm going to strategically tariff that so that I, I am boosting our ability to uh, compete with steel. And now I, I, I fully advocate I don't have a problem with that. Putting tariffs across the board on literally everything that comes in the country, like you you're suddenly going to make everything way more expensive. And it's not like you've got a massive microwave oven manufacturing um, market in, in the US, right? So if you want to buy a microwave oven, you're going to spend 200% more or whatever. Yeah, yeah, this is just insane economic policy. They'll, they'll approve it. They'll approve it. And number one, I don't need them. I don't need Congress, but they'll approve it. I have the right to impose them myself if they don't. Question? Just listen to what he's saying. So actually, you need to get this through Congress, right? So how are you going to do that? He said, they'll approve it. But if they don't, uh, I've got the right to put it through myself. I'll get it through myself. So if you're worried about, you know, Project 2025, if you're worried about purging of the government, if you're worrying about, like, moving towards autocracy, if you're worried about his dictatorial intentions, you've got the, the nominee for president saying, I'm not going to worry about Congress. I'm just going to smash it through myself. Uh, I'll have the right to do that. Mm, how, how does that work? Unless you're planning on becoming a dictator, how does that work? I need Congress, but they'll approve it. I'll have the right to impose them myself. I'll have the right to impose them myself. I'm going to have the right to impose tariffs myself. Just fish, bash, bosh. Oh, and also, if you don't say things I, uh, if you say things I don't like, I'm going to have the right to execute you too. Just, I'll just throw that one in there. Like, so when then we go back to people worrying that he's a threat to democracy, like he's telling you he's a threat. to He's literally laying it out there, guys, guys, I'm going to ignore Congress. I'm going to just do what I like because uh, I'll have that right. Bish, bash, bosh. Um, right. Uh, this again, just talking about lies. So going back to what Michael Medved said about lies. They want to almost immediately go to all electric. And we don't have enough electric to take care of ourselves. You go to California, they have blackouts and brownouts every single day. California is a mess. They have the uh, governor of California, Gavin Newsom. Has anybody ever heard of him? 
but we're he's a child right he can't say gavin newsom he has to say gavin newscum right like he's scum has anyone ever heard of him you got one person shortening has anybody ever heard of him but worse they had an attorney general and a da who destroyed san francisco and then destroyed california and i hate to say they want and it's interesting he goes back because he i think he's been corrected on the previously when he said 15 years ago you know san francisco was great and people have pointed out to him that that was when newsom and and uh, like i said earlier harris were in charge and now he's saying oh yeah they were terrible when they were in charge and of course it's just contradiction after contradiction but here as as brian tyler cohen says i've lived in california for 15 years i cannot recall a single blackout or brownout Meanwhile, in Texas, they can't manage to keep the power on. So in a Republican-run state, problems. In California, no problems. And yet Trump sits there and, and lies. He just absolutely lies. He says, it's chaos in California. It's all terrible. Blackouts and brownouts every single day. It's just not true. Um, okay. Uh, right. This is a real worry, I think. Uh, lots of people talking about this. All right. So we have to talk... Business. I always thought women liked me. I never thought I had a problem. Just the context of this is Roe v. Wade being repealed. Dobbs, take it to the states, but you got however many states, you know, doing really harsh uh, abortion rulings such that there are no exceptions for rape and incest. You've got him, a person who's been found liable for for sexual assault which the the judge admitted was rape it's just in that in uh that area that's how it's defined when it's non um i don't want to get to the long weeds here because i'll get in trouble but go and look go and look at what the the uh the judge said there and it is indeed right but even if you don't want to call it that sexual assault um it, that that is who he is well, that is a jury of his peers has found him and he owes all that money um, and for defamation of that person who was a victim in sexual assault and now he's defaming her repeatedly and yet he's saying he's the protector all right so we have to talk Business. of I women thought women liked me i never thought I had access hollywood tapes grabbing but the fake news keeps saying women don't like me i don't believe it i think i think you know why they like literally statistically struggling with women compared to the democrats they like to have strong borders they like to have safety nothing personal i think they like me but i make this statement thank you i love you too i love you too thank you but i think they like me because i represent something that's very important i make this statement to the great women of our country sadly women are poorer than they were four years ago, much poorer, are less healthy than they were four years ago, are less safe on the streets than they were four years ago, are paying much higher prices for groceries and everything else than they were four years ago, are more stressed and depressed and unhappy than they were four years ago, and are less optimistic and confident in the future than they were four years ago. I believe that. I will fix all of that and fast, and at long last, this nation and national nightmare will end. It will end. We've got to end this national nightmare. Because I am your protector. I want to be your protector. As president, I have to be your protector. I hope you don't make too much of it. I hope the fake news doesn't go, oh, he wants to be their protector. Well, I am. As president, I have to be your protector. I will make you safe at the border, on the sidewalks of your now violent cities, in the suburbs where you are under migrant criminal siege, and with our military protecting you from foreign enemies of which we have many today so on and so forth uh so he's a protector he's a protector even though 26 26 women have come forward stating how he's sexually assaulted them so this has not gone down very well with women which is the kind of demographic he really needs to appeal to make of what uh trump was just saying there a few moments ago and and do you consider 
Donald Trump to be your protector, your quote protector? Oh dear, Jim, <laughs> I find that set of statements creepy, literally creepy. Uh, I'm a mom, I have three daughters-in-law. Uh, we don't want Donald Trump's protection. We want our rights, we want our freedoms. This is coming from the man uh, who was fa found responsible for uh, s sexual assault and, and um, requires payment for that, civil damages for that. He's not a protector. We know exactly who he is. More than that, it's creepy. On the other hand, women are capable of protecting themselves. We want Americans to protect one another, to have one another's back. That is just plain creepy. On the issue of abortion, the nonsensical, uh, illogical things he just said, tell that to the two families that we were just revealed, uh, young women who lost their lives because they were denied health care, abortion care. Tell that to the 28-year-old, uh, family of the 28-year-old woman who lost her life, the mother of other children who lost her life because she was denied abortion care. And this is a massive topic that has become a real hot potato for the Republicans because they know they're losing in the uh, court of, of public appeal in terms of like abortion. They, they are, and they need to, he knows that, which is why he's saying, I'll be your protector. He's trying to, to claw the female vote back. I mean, that's a horrible image, isn't it? And so is that. I'm your protector. I just, yeah, uh, brilliant. Uh, so I think they, you know, in the same way that Democrats recognize they need to fight hard on the economy and immigration, the Republicans know they need to fight hard on abortion because they are losing the female vote really significantly. And now talking about polls and, and, and prospective votes and whatnot, really interesting bit of data came out recently. Here's Chris, uh, Chris Silitza. I don't know how you pronounce his surname. Young voters. I think are going to decide this election, and let me tell you why. Okay, there is a new poll from the Institute of Politics at Harvard. You may have heard of it. Uh, and this is a poll that I think is the best poll of young people. That's 18 to 29-year-olds that's done in the country. They consistently focus on that age cohort. I think they do a really good job of monitoring that age cohort. So these numbers are, I think, sort of top of the class, best in class sort of stuff. Okay, um, what do they show? Let's get into it. A couple data points I want to talk to you about, and then I want to go big and tell you why I think it matters. Among likely voters, the people most likely to vote between 18 and 29, Kamala Harris is at 61% to Donald Trump's 30%. Percent Now, 61 to 30, that is young people 18 to 29 more likely to vote for her than him by a considerable margin. You ask, how does that compare to past elections? I got that information for you. In 2020, Joe Biden won 18 to 29 year olds 60 to 36, so a 24 point margin. In 2016, Hillary Clinton won 18 to 29 year olds 55-36 over Donald Trump, a 19-point margin. So at least right now, Kamala Harris, according to this poll, Kamala Harris is pretty significantly outperforming Biden in 2020 and definitely significantly outperforming Hillary Clinton in 2016. Will it hold? We'll see. Is this poll exactly right? We'll see. Um, but I do think that young voter, 18 to 29, critically critically important and i want to go a little deeper I don't so well worth watching that as well and it's worth noting that if some of these are first-time voters they will not appear on uh sort of uh you know the, the, he talks about likely voters uh, but in terms of those who haven't voted before there's no form and and they might not appear on polls and so it, there are arguments as to uh, the gop being undercounted trump being undercounted as happened in 2020 but then in 2022 the democrats were undercounted but that was in a midterm election not a presidential election uh so how does that work out and have the pollsters got it correct now and then here we've got this massive surge of young voters which could really benefit kamala harris and especially you know, it, they also might not turn up in the numbers uh, that are needed to get an accurate tell on the on the polls. They might not turn up in the polls. Uh, so, 
Yeah, and again, also, not again, I haven't said this yet, but it depends on how the polls are conducted. It's worth looking at methodologies, whether these are mobile phone polls, whether they're internet polls, whether they are landline telephone number polls, how will that affect the sorts of people, what selection bias is going to be involved in those polls. Um, but but that really, really important there. Now, nearly 1.4 million mail and absentee ballots have been requested in Pennsylvania. Here's how the breakdown looks. 62.9% of them are Democratic, 26.3% are Republican, others are 10.8%. Um, uh, looks like it's going to be in the favor of Democrats. Uh, it's inter interesting analysis by voting trends, looking at early voting in a few states and saying that generally it's favoring Democrats at the moment in how it's looking when you compare it to previous points in time. So you've got something to compare it against that. But it's a bit too early to have a solid on what's going on there. Now, just today, this was um, this was announced by MSNBC. This is a Bloomberg News Morning Consult. Morning Consult are a C-rated pollster, but they're one of these main pollsters you see all the time. But actually, they're, they're not massively... You know, they're, they're, they're not like an A-rated pollster. However, Bloomberg Morning Consult, look at that. That's, that's, that's pretty... Outstanding. So these are the these are the swing state, the battleground state polls. Arizona, Harris plus three, she was tied. Georgia now tied, she was plus three. It's a bit of a reversal there. Michigan plus three from plus two. Nevada plus seven from plus four. Uh, North Carolina plus two from tied. Uh, Pennsylvania plus five from plus three. And Wisconsin plus three from plus nine. So that's gone down, but most of the others going up, apart from Georgia. So, but either way, that's all looking very good. But then, you know, some of them is outside the margin of error. So you're, you're going to be fairly confident that you know, Pennsylvania from that should go. Nevada should go. But, uh, but it's, then we've seen other um, polls that is not quite so uh, so positive. But generally, the polls are looking good. So at 5.38, we get the average, re recent polling average. This is interesting. So for presidential, forget the Senate for now, but presidential, the North Carolina is even. Georgia is a Republican plus one. Arizona is a Republican plus one. Nevada, Democrat plus one. Pennsylvania, Democrat plus two. Wisconsin, Democrat plus two, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these are averages, and they've been skewing more and more towards or trending, sorry, more and more towards Harris. So those averages will change. They're the averages over some long period of time. But if you take the last three days of average, the last five days of average, that would look very different. And you can tell that by just looking at the actual polls. So first one up here is general election, just general election as it is, outward intelligence. Harris plus six, plus six. Um, you've got Nevada, um, Harris plus one plus four plus one plus four Trump plus one Harris plus seven plus six plus four plus two there's only one Trump one there Qantas Insights much smaller uh, or not much smaller it's much smaller than Tip Insight one but um, yeah so that is that an outlier it looks that way uh, but amazing polls there for Harris like the amount of blue on the, on these polls uh, so presidential we've got Harris plus five plus seven plus four plus five plus five no Trump up on general election Wisconsin Harris plus three plus three plus two plus two uh, Pennsylvania Harris plus five plus six plus three plus six plus three plus three uh, North Carolina Harris plus two plus two plus three plus two Michigan plus three plus four plus two plus four there are no Trump apart from that pl single plus one for um, one of the Nevada polls, everything is Harris up. Uh, and um, yeah, Arizona, uh, general generic ballot, uh, Democrat plus five, so on and so forth. Uh, and then we go on to other types of polls below there. But you get the point that the, the tr these polls at the moment are really going in favor of Harris. Uh, her average at the moment is 2.7, sort of hanging around the, the twos, mid twos to late twos. Uh, she was at three sometime back. That was probably post DNC. Um, but yeah, it, it, that stayed fairly much around where it is. But it, but yeah, I think the polls are definitely looking good for Harris. But it's all about what the October surprise might be and about keeping uh, in the news cycles the whole time. She needs to win the news cycles with Trump. I, I don't know what he can do. He just needs to change the way he does his entire campaign at the moment because I don't think his campaign is good enough to win the election as it stands if he's just going to appeal to those same people that he's always appealed to. Now, Voting Trends, who, who's great, uh, this is a great channel. He's done his, as it stands right now, this is what it's looking like uh, as far as the Electoral College 
goes and he has um his analysis is very much in favor of the democrats 292 to 246 with wisconsin michigan just and pennsylvania in the, the democrats uh bag he's got north carolina and actually we're looking at the polls in north carolina it's looking like mark robinson is not doing them any favors there the republicans any favors there that's looking like that's going to go to the Repub uh, the democrats as it stands nevada even more so arizona he's got us going to the republicans there interesting discussions about texas people are saying texas and florida might be in in play at the moment either at the whole statewide level doubt it but um, possibly could be a a a, a sleeper uh, win for senators, maybe all red in uh, in Texas against Ted Cruz, and maybe you might see Rick Scott losing in uh, Florida. So as an outside bet, that would be probably quite good. Georgia, he's got going to the Republicans. So interesting to see his rationale for that he knows his onions as well he's been working in in polling for like 30 years in lots of different states or was it 30 states for however many years anyway he's he's worked himself around knows his stuff does his cross tabs really well and that is is an interesting analysis but these things can change it's quite dynamic isn't it something goes horribly wrong thing for either side things can uh, move anyway that's enough from me that's where we're at at the moment. I think it's it's trending towards Harris still, uh, but she needs to win those news cycles, stay in the news and talk in punchy uh, but detailed way. Is that is that an oxymoron? Punchy but detailed way about uh, immigration and about the economy and really hang Trump to dry on a number of, uh, of the topics, like, for example, abortion. Um, and, uh, and obviously the opposite is true for Trump. Uh, let me know what you guys think. Take care. Speak to you soon.